I want you to take your Bible, turn to John chapter 17, and um, this is one of the things that um, apparently the devil just wanted me to stay away from. There's no doubt about it, and I mean I have absolutely no doubt about it. Um, I was talking with another pastor today. Uh, about the issue that's uh, going on in uh, the Free Will Baptist denomination, what we used to be part of years ago. I guess we, I guess we probably had our last meeting with them. I know it was probably in the early 2000s. I know it was before 2006. Um, but somewhere around in there, we just we just finally said, no, nah, we're not. We can't we can't go along with certain things. And um, one preacher said it like this. He said, we didn't leave them. They left us. We stood still. We stood on what was right. We stood on the word of God. We stood on uh, issues that are biblical issues. And uh, so we stood still and they moved away. And so that. You know, pretty much sums it up for us. We stood still in what we believed in, and and uh, I remember us having meetings, and at the time that the whole church was saying, you know what, what do we need the denomination for anyway? And uh, you could you could not have convinced me of that twenty years prior to that. You could not have ever told me that we would be leaving uh, the denomination, but we did. And uh, we're not we're not ever going back. And um, and the thing is, don't look back. Looking in the Bible that uh, if you if you find an application in your life, if you find one application in your life, you'll probably find other ones. And that is, and it's characterized in Ruth, but it's also seen in other places. Uh, it's seen in Christ, where Christ, when it came time for him to be crucified. Um, he went outside, in other words, they took him away from the temple and outside the city to be crucified. And, um, what the, and he left the land of his nativity. Remember, he was from uh, Bethlehem of Judah, and he left that land of his nativity. The Gal- uh, well, he was a Nazarene, so he left all of that. And... Um, but in the story of Ruth, Ruth was a Moabite woman, and um, when, um, when I think who was it, Elkanah? No, it wasn't Elkanah. That was um, Hannah's husband. But anyway, when Naomi's husband died, then her two sons died. Um, they were in Moab because there was a famine in Israel, and Naomi said to the two daughters-in-law. You guys stay here. I'm going to go back home and see if there's any kinfolk there that'll take me in. And uh, but you girls who were born here, this is your land. You stay here. And uh, Orpa decided to stay, stay in the land of her nativity, stay in the land with her gods. But it was Ruth who left the place where she was born, left the land of her nativity. And came out of that, left the gods that were there. And this is where in the Bible you'll see uh, that statement, Whither thou goest, I will go. And, um, and she did. She followed Naomi all the way into that land. And she, didn't, she had no idea where she was going. The customs were strange. The people were strange. They're Jews. Jews are always strange. But she went into that land and she stayed there and God blessed her. God gave her, not, God didn't just give her a husband, he gave her a rich one. Amen. Nothing better than that. that she's be, way better off with her second husband than she was her first. But then God gave her a baby and she, of course, gave that to Naomi. And you guys know the story. But she had to leave the land of her nativity. The, with, for me, the land of my nativity was that denomination. That was the land that I was born in. That's the land that I would have served and stayed in. And yet God uh, saw fit to have me leave that place and come out from it. And when I look at it in the condition that it's in right now, I'm thankful 
that he did it when he did. Uh, because I know me better than anybody else in this world knows except God. And I'm telling you, more than likely, I probably would have been right along with them. Just for the popularity of it. And it's just wrong. So I was talking to another, another pastor about it today. And he, he and I shared the same sentiment about what's going on. And it has everything to do with uh, what I had already planned on speaking on tonight. And that is uh, John chapter 17. And here again, Jesus is praying to his heavenly father. And he's praying for his disciples that God has given him. We'll read this and we'll go to prayer and then you'll see what it is that uh, I'm talking about. And boy, I mean, heavy heart even over this, it's heavy over it. But anyway, let's read this and we'll pray tonight. John chapter 17, verse 6, Jesus said to his holy father, I have manifested thy name. That's what we dealt with last Wednesday night. Uh, by the way, you... Okay, Ja is just, um, in fact, let me, let me look that up. Ja is just another form of Jehovah, okay? Um, in fact, basically, it's, you're almost saying the same thing. If I type that in, you'll find it's only one place in the Bible. And Psalm 64, 8, sing unto God, sing praises to his name, specifically his name. And extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Jah, and rejoice before him. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't looked that up in uh, the Bible to see what the Hebrew of that was. Uh, but you can do that on your own. Um, but I'm going to ask you a question tonight. A lot of you, hopefully a lot of you already know the answer to this question. We spent a lot of time last Wednesday night looking at the significance uh, of God's name. Why is it important? Jesus said there that uh, I have uh, manifested thy name. I made known to them thy, what your name was. Um, we know that God pre uh, presented himself in different ways to different people. Uh, he finally tells Moses, you know, to Abraham, I was this, the, the mighty one of God. But he said, by my name, Jehovah, was I not known unto him. So now he introduces this name, Jehovah. But all through the scriptures, the most predominant name that we have given to our God by way of those four Hebrew letters, yod heh vah -He, is the Lord. That is his name name I am the Lord that is my name and my glory will I not give to another and he makes it so easy and so simple that that's his name the Lord whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved in our talk as Christians we are so used to that being his name it's ingrained to us and whenever we refer to Something that, you know, has happened or something we might think about doing or so, just anything in life. In a conversation, we will say, well, you know, the Lord did this or the Lord, you know, praise the Lord that this didn't happen. Or, um, you know, if, if it be the Lord's will, we're going to take off tomorrow and do this. We are always constantly using his name, the Lord, to refer to him. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know of any other religion um, that uses that name the way that we use it, with the exception of George Harrison, of the Beatles, and that con job song that he tried to sell to these Christian Americans called My Sweet Lord. Does anybody know what name he pronounced in that song as his Lord. Does anybody know? Huh? I have to think about it. My sweet Lord. Ha they start out singing hallelujah. Now the word, yeah, the, the word hallelujah has Jah in it. Jehovah. So they start out, hallelujah. And then as the song progresses, my sweet Lord, Hare Krishna. Then it, all of a sudden now it's Hinduism. And uh, enjoy that, George. Hope you, hope you made a lot of money off that. 
Because that's all you're getting. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's, we, use, we use that name. It's ingrained in us. This is the Lord's house. We are the Lord's people. Um, this is the table of the Lord, the house of the Lord, the word of the Lord. Everything we say is the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. But there is one. Thou shalt not take the name of who? The Lord, thy God in vain. For God will not hold him guiltless. Now, one thing that God specifically said that he has magnified even above his name. It's his word. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So we're worried about cussing. We're worried about taking the Lord's name in vain. We're worried about this. But God has placed the words of this book in a higher holiness and reverence than even above his name. So, if let's say a man lives his life and he doesn't commit any sins, but he takes the name of the Lord in vain, is he going to go to hell? Yes, one sin. Okay, it's all it takes, one sin. He's dead, he's, he's going, he broke God's commandment. What do you think God then would do to someone who has left his word and forsaken it? If he has magnified his word above his name. Let's read this. I've manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And here it is, and they have kept thy word. Now I want you to understand all the things that that phrase could mean. They've kept thy, they've kept thy word. They've kept thy word. They kept it. They adhered to it. In fact, I'll ask you that question. Well, I'll let, I'll let you help me define it here in a minute. Let's pray. Father, I need prayer today. I need help. And uh, Lord, a lot of people here today, Lord, do. And I thank you, Father, for uh, getting us through this day. It's just been taxing on everybody. And uh, Lord, I feel bad uh, for all the people here because of the aggravation the frustration that the, the frustration they've seen me in and i don't like being that way around anybody i don't god you know my heart and so father if i offended anybody today lord would you forgive me and would you give them a soft heart then they could forgive me as well because nobody deserves that and father i pray god that you would just uh, again bless uh, all of us lord that and, and anybody, anybody online, anybody in this church that's had a rough day, I pray, God, that you would help them, bless them, and give them grace. And Father, I thank you for this book, and you have magnified it in my mind and in my heart, but there is nothing, there is nothing to me that is of higher authority and, and higher than the Word of God. And I thank you for it. And I pray, dear God, that you would restore that the way you've done it in me, Father, I, I, and there's a lot of other preachers out there, Father, that I, I couldn't judge them because maybe, Lord, they haven't gotten to that place that you took me to. But, Lord, I know, God, that they need your word. They need it bad. And I pray, God, that soon you would do in them what you've done with me. And God, just have mercy on them and show us, show us your word tonight in keeping your word and help us to keep it, especially in this day right now. Father, it's bad. It is going to get worse. It's going to get very, very much worse. And Father, the word that we believe in and that we stand on, Lord, will be, will be the only thing that holds us together, binds us together, and enables us to stand uh, in these evil days that are coming. So we ask your blessings on it. And bless tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. So you said they've, they've kept thy word. Now God enabled them to do that. He helped them do that. He, he, so, he knitted it into their heart to where they're, just, they're not walking away from it. They're not going away from it. 
So uh, just that phrase, kept thy word. Let me just go around the room. And what does that mean to you when it says kept thy word? Yes, Chris. It's there. It's there. And I, and I would agree with that. Now, it's not an issue of... We're not saying that, well, I can't keep that commandment. So I'll just say, God probably didn't mean that. And believe it or not, I have recently seen YouTube videos that in, have views into the hundreds of thousands already. Where it, it's these people, they're, they're, they're putting out, I, I gotcha videos is what I call them. I gotcha. Clickbait. They say things to get your attention like, um, uh, you've heard the Bible say thou shalt not commit adultery. But does it really mean that? And find out. And then they go off on some wild thing. Uh, they made one, you know, thou shalt not steal. But does it? But the Bible doesn't really mean steal, like stealing something from someone. And they just come up with all kinds of nonsense. Well, the original Hebrew this, original Greek that. And, and they're just, to me, that's, that's just, it, it's, it's blasphemy is what it is. It is absolute blasphemy. To call God a liar, to call God's word a liar is blasphemy. And I'll say that till the day I die. So I agree with you, Chris. But in, in the sense that you still believe that stealing is wrong... And it's wrong not because you feel bad or somebody is now missing something that you have taken from them. And that's what makes it wrong. It's wrong because God said it was wrong. And that's the end of it. And while you may not be able to keep that commandment perfectly, you still believe it is the absolute word of God. And if you or anybody else steals, there, there will be an accounting for that one of these days. Okay? It, it, it's like saying... It's like saying, I, listen, I believe in the speed limit here on this, on American Legion Drive. It's 30 miles an hour, and I've been driving this same stretch now every day for the last 25 years. I've been driving the same, or more than that, same stretch of road every day, back and forth. And it's 30 miles an hour that way, and 30 miles an hour this way. And if you see me on that road, I'm doing 30 miles an hour. Every now and then, I might hit up to 35. Now, that's just the flaw in me. Okay, which means I cannot perfectly keep a steady speed limit of 30, 30 miles an hour. But that's what I believe about that speed limit and in, a, in that place. I believe it's the right one and, and I adhere to it. And I believe that the, the city of Festus has the right to set a speed limit for this road out in front of us. It has the right to set the speed limit in any street in, in Festus, Missouri. The state of Missouri has the right to establish and set speed limits for every county road, county highway, and so on. The state of Missouri has the right to establish uh, speed limits. The federal government has the right. Thank God we're not still driving 55 miles an hour anymore. Oh my goodness. Take me 10 hours to drive to Oklahoma City from my house or from where mom and dad live. And when they bumped it up to 70, man, I'm just, man, I'm having a good time driving this. Uh, um, anyway, but I believe in those speed limits. And I believe we ought to keep them. Amen? So that's, that's one application of that meaning, is keeping it. Let's keep it that way. Okay? It's like this issue now that uh, they're putting these, I mean, filthy, pornographic books in third and second and first graders' libraries, putting it in their hands with drawings and with descriptions of what two women do, two men do, a man and a woman does. It is absolutely pornographic and it is against the law. One guy, one guy testified, he said, I inherited a box of about 80 Playboy magazines from my dad who passed away. I've inherited them. They go all the way back into the 60s. He said, there probably was something, but I tell you what, why don't you let me donate them to the public uh, school, elementary school library because it has good articles in it. And that's what he said. 
And he said, that's exactly what you're doing. And these people ought to be arrested for the distribution of pornographic material to children. That's a law already on the books. I believe we ought to keep that one. Amen? All right. Now, what else does it mean, keep thy word? Yes. Amen. That's a good one. Anybody else? Yes, Josiah? Yeah. Good one. What he said it's not French. What he's saying is that this this word that God spoke into my DNA, I'm keeping it. I'm not going to let anybody else alter it or change it. For any reason, I'm keeping it. Okay? Who in here has a nose? Raise your hand. Liam, do you have a nose? Okay? Can I have it? Well, I've already got it. I got your nose. Okay? Who would like to keep your nose? Don't let anybody else have it. That's one good meaning of that. As you would not let anybody take your nose, your eyes, your ears, your feet off of you. Well, somebody else needs feet. So give them the feet. By the way, we have better feet now. That's what Ahab said to Naboth, I'll give you a way better vineyard than the one you got. Well, if it's better, why don't you use it? Why don't you turn it into a garden of herbs? Okay? That's a con job is what it was. Oh, I got a much better one. Then you use it. Okay? They have kept thy word. They have not given it up. They've not let it go. They've not let somebody else have it. And they intend to keep it. until Now, after I die... You want my feet? You're welcome to them. You want my heart, my kidneys, my lungs, my eyes, whatever you want. You want it? It's yours. I don't need it no more. Don't want it no more. Amen. So now watch. From 1611 to about 1901, in the English-speaking world, there was practically one Bible. All through the 1600s, as the Geneva Bible sort of lost ground and they, people started settling for the King James, all through the 1700s, all through the 1800s, into the 1900s, the King of England wanted and he had the right to he had the right to do it he said i want to update the language of the kings of the of the realms bible the authorized bible to take out these and thousands and stuff like that put you in it and but update the language so people can understand a little bit better that's what he wanted so he got west cotton hort these two uh worthless apostates to work on it and they didn't just update the language. They called it the. Re they ended up calling it the revised version because it bore no resemblance whatsoever to the King James Bible. So the king said, "Well, you haven't really given me the authorized Bible that we had. You didn't really update it. You altered a, a lot of the text by going off with this, uh, these other uh, manuscripts, these other Greek manuscripts." And so I can't really accept that as an official change to the, thank you God for West Cotton Hort 
been so far out of the way that we still have the same Bible as they had in 1611. That's the only way I'll thank God for West Cotton Hort. It's the only way I'll do it. But anyway, the King James remained largely unchallenged. Some use the RSV, but not as much as the KJB. So now we're going 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, all through the 1900s. We get to uh, the 21st century, and we get to 2011, 400 years. And still, the King James Bible is the number one selling Bible ever. But, starting in 1971, the Challengers moved in. New American Standard, NIV, 1973. New King James Bible, 1980. So the 1611 began to be put out of use. You know what, they, you know what the pastors... Who made this, and when I was in, when I, in 1985, when I was in my, 84 to 85, it was the first, my year, first year of Bible college, there was a, they let you pick one of several Free Will Baptist churches in the Oklahoma City area to go to, but you had to go to church on Sunday. And um, a, lot of the, a lot of the students were picking this one down in Norman, Oklahoma, which is where OU is. And they had a... They had a liberal pastor then, and he put, he was the first one that I ever knew that had replaced the King James out of his church with NIV Bibles. And this was 1984. And I'm just going, that ain't right. I knew it wasn't right then. But anyway, so what had happened was this pastor and this church, they decided not to keep it. You say, well, that's awfully judgmental. Well, they didn't keep 1 John 5, 7. They didn't keep Acts 8, 37. They didn't keep prayer and fasting. This kind of go not, not out, but by prayer and fasting. They didn't keep the fourth is the Son of God. All of these and thousands of other changes that the NIV made versus the King James. 60,000 some odd less words. They didn't keep those words. They decided to put them away and go with something different. Now, let's go back to this. Jesus said of the disciples that he had, they have kept thy word. That means when the offer came of a new Bible, they said, no. No. We're keeping this one. And we're not going to give it up. But over time, that's exactly what started happening. Charles Stanley, in his early years, probably preached out of a King James. Billy Graham did. You go back and listen to Billy Graham's sermons from the early 70s. Hell, fire, brimstone, King James Bible preaching. I would get saved all over again, just listening to him. Okay? God, save me again. Make me born again, 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 again. Okay? But that's not how he ended. He didn't keep it. Charles Stanley didn't keep it. And so now his son, Andy Stanley. You've heard me talk about him. This is his exact words. Andy Stanley said in a recent sermon, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. This is where our trouble began. The implication is the Bible is the reason we believe. I can believe Jesus loves me because it's in the Bible. The problem with that is this. If the Bible is the foundation of our faith, as the Bible goes, so goes our faith. And you know what? Him and I agree on that statement right there. Because as the Bible goes, the faith goes. And it already left him. This man is reprobate. If the Bible is the foundation of our faith, it is all or nothing. Christianity becomes a fragile house of cards religion. Now, you can read this book cover to cover and you will never find any place where God says that his religion is fragile because it's based upon his word. 
that you find the exact opposite of that. Uh, and that, let me look that verse up. You can write this down in the front of your Bible. Uh, I ought to have it memorized. I ought to know where it is. I tell people about it all the time. Um, yeah. Psalm 138, 2. I will worship toward the holy temple, thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So if God, and this is God saying this, this is not man, this is not the Pope. Uh, this is not the independent fundamental Baptist. Uh, this is not anybody else. This is God saying this, that God has magnified his word above all his name. So however high God's name is, his word is higher than that. So he goes on to say Christianity becomes a fragile house of cards that comes tumbling down when we discover that perhaps the walls of Jericho didn't. Now what he's saying is, if archaeology can't prove that the walls of Jericho actually came tumbling down, then that must mean the Bible's wrong. No, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. I would look for where Jericho really is. Okay? And when you find it, and you find pieces of walls laying all over the place you either going to cover that up or you're going to report on it and say it looks like we found the walls of Jericho cha-ching God wins that one it's like them finding the place uh, exactly where Paul said in Arabia where Mount Sinai is and it has it bears all the marks Everything of where Mount Sinai and all the things that happened on Mount Sinai right there at a place called Jabal El Laws. It's there. Chariot wheels. Chariot. There are scuba expeditions where they take people to show them chariot wheels in the bottom of the Red Sea. Are you kidding me? So, I mean, this... I would just like to stand in front of Andy Stanley and say, you are dumb. And that'd be, that'd be the end. I wouldn't want to talk to me after that. Everything rises and falls on whether or not part, uh, not, not, on whether or not part, but all the Bible is true. And that's unfortunate. And as we're going to discover today, unnecessary. In other words, so he preached a message that you don't need the Bible to be a Christian. He's an idiot, he's a reprobate, he's an apostate, and anybody in that church who falls for that junk, and he's got a big church, and as far as I know, they, the deacons didn't get together and say, well, I want to tell you something, I believe the Bible. We need to get us another pastor, throw him out. They didn't, as far as I know, they didn't do that. So they kept him with that, lie coming out of his mouth he's going to pay for that he is he's going to pay for that um what am i doing psalm 119 67 before i was afflicted i went astray but now have i kept thy word so in this verse what is one of the purposes of affliction in your life so you can remember to keep God's word. Affliction in this case is a chastisement from God. A whooping. A beating. Because you thought that you could get away from God's word and, get, and, and, and God will be okay with it and, and be fine with it and get away with and get away from it. And God then poured it out on you. A 55-gallon drum of whooping on you. Beating you bad to where you couldn't walk. I threatened one of my grandchildren today. I'll whip you until you can't walk. Didn't hear no more from him that day. Revelation 3, 8. Jesus said, I know thy work. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. And has kept my word. And has not denied my 
name. Notice back in that verse where Jesus was talking about this, he said, I manifested thy name unto the men and they have kept thy word. And here he tells this church, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also, or, or yeah, I'm sorry, Revelation 3, 8. He said, uh, for thou hast kept my word and has not denied my name. They're both together. And then in verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee. What, what does it mean, the word of my patience? What do you think that means? Who in here lacks patience? I'm waiting for you to raise your hand. Hurry up. Do you know what, you know what will give you patience while you're waiting on God to move or waiting on God to do something? His word. Busy yourself with reading the Bible, reading the word. Go to Psalms. Go to Proverbs. My goodness, go, go to something that interests you. If, if study of giants interests you, then study giants. If, you know, if you want to look for big, Bigfoot or UFOs in the Bible, then, then do that. Look for them in there. If, if you want to study, whatever it is you are interested in, if you want to study stars, study, study them out of the Bible. Whatever you, you are interested in, study the Bible. Read it out of the Bible. And next thing you know, God's answering prayer. Boom. Thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So the obvious, the obvious conclusion that is made here is that, and, and this, is, this is what it means to keep it. You're not getting it. You're not getting it. Okay? The quarterback gave you the football, told you to run down to that end zone down there, and everybody between you and that end zone is going to try to rip that out of your arms. Now you hold on to that thing and you don't let it go until you get to that end zone. Until you get to the end, we'll give you a million dollar bonus if you do that. Shoot, I'd hang on to that. Don't take this away from me. This is all I've got that's going to keep me from through this life to the next one. And this is it. It's the only thing that's going to do it. Keep it. Um, oh yeah, Genesis 26, this is what God said to Abraham. I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto thy seed all these countries and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Abraham kept them. Even, now was Abraham perfect? No. Did he sin? Yes. But did he ever say about something God said, I'm not, I'm not going to obey that. that uh, no, I, I don't believe in that. He never did that. Even when, and I was, I was praying the other day, man, I was just about to cry. Thinking about Abraham taking Isaac to lay him on an altar. God, don't you ever ask me to do that. But he asked Abraham to do it. And Abraham did it. You know why? Because he knew that God would never lie to him. And he was going to keep his word. Hmm. 1 Kings 11. Because th that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians. Chemosh, the God of the Moabites, and Milcom, the God of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments. See, there it is. Keep my they have not kept my statutes. They did not keep my judgments. As did David, his father. Uh, and this is speaking of uh, Rehoboam. Howbeit, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David, my servant's sake, whom I chose, because he, David, kept my commandments and my statutes. David kept them. Solomon, hmm, he did a lot of bad things, okay? So God was going to rip the kingdom in half, give part to Rehoboam, the other part to Jeroboam. Ezekiel 18, 
God said, if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, and hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon you... Uh, Usury, which is high interest, neither have taken any increase that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just, he shall surely live, saith the Lord. God saying, if you keep my words, you'll live. And he's not just talking about living here. To your 90, 95, 100 years old. He's talking about living forever. That man's going to live. Luke 8, 15. The four groups that received the seed. The wayside, the stony ground, the thorny ground, and the good ground. The good ground is that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it. And if you keep it, you won't have to work and feverishly try to do everything you can for God to bring forth fruit. If you just keep the word, the fruit will come out. It's that simple. Luke 11, and it came to pass as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up. Oh, I like this one. I like this one. I was going to bring my picture of Mary out here. Somebody sent me posters that they had gotten in the mail. One, one of Jesus, and it had thorns around his heart. And another one was of Mary and had thorns around her heart. They believe she's involved in your salvation. And so here, you, remember what women represent in the Bible? What do they represent? Churches. So look at this woman, Josiah. A certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said, Blessed is the womb that bear thee in the paps which thou hast sucked. What woman would that be? Catholic Church. The woman here ends up being the Catholic Church because they believe that she is the blessed one of God. She's the... And I was going to do it today. I'm not kidding you. I was supposed to record a watchman today. And it was so bad. I couldn't even get to it. But what I've got is the Catholic Church calls her not only co-redemptrix. I'm trying to think of the word. The star of Jacob. They call her the morning star. That's blasphemy. So this woman here is the Catholic Church who worships the womb that bare Jesus and the paps that gave him suck. In other words, we're going to worship your mother. But Jesus corrected him. He knew what was coming, but he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. We're not letting it go. Jesus answered and said unto him, if, if a man loved me, he will keep my words. So this revival in Kentucky. It was all about experiences. It was all about gushy feelings. It was all about a big show and youthful zeal. But it had nothing to do with the Bible. If a man loved me, he'll keep my words. And my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. There you are, there you are uh, uh, Andy Stanley. I would say that to you if you were standing here too. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father which sent me. Uh, I will make this the last one. Yet, yet say, this is Ezekiel 18. Yet say you, why, why doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right and has kept all my statutes, he kept them. 
and hath done them, he surely shall live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will, not, will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes, there it is, boom. You not only have to repent, but you got to keep the word of God. And what's happened is, We've got half of Christianity missing. Oh, they believe in turning from sin, some of them. But they have nothing to do with the Bible. And keep my statutes and do that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? That's what God wants. He wants them to turn. He wants them to repent. And he wants them to believe, for goodness sakes, what he said. But you can't get people to do that anymore. The conversation that I had with this pastor today was, and we agreed on this, we agreed. So many families now in Free Will Baptist churches whose positions now have been compromised because of the LGBTQ that is in every family. And this pastor told me that, and I know his brother and his sister. He said his brother's son is transitioning. And he said his sister's daughter, I think, uh, or granddaughter is getting married to a woman and he said it's in my family too and he said I love them I pray for them God can save anybody say amen God saved me God saved you and I'm all for I think there's two groups of people who have who deal with this issue those who deal with it and know it's wrong and those who deal with it and don't care and when it comes to them i got no room for them i got no time for them i'm not going to entertain them i'm not going to invite them over for dinner and i'm certainly not going to play um yacht or not yachts what is it yeah yahtzee huh No, not Yahtzee. Huh? You, where you put the thing on the floor and you put your hand in your foot. Twister. Yeah, I'm not playing Twister with them. Not, not, not going to do that. Yeah, you should not play Twister anyway, but certainly with, yeah. But I am, I am all for helping anyone. Anyone. Amen.